Okay, uh, good morning. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for the uh, invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be here and share some of my thoughts on um, the paradoxes confronting leaders and organizations. I was uh, thinking this morning that this is uh, the first time in my life, and I'm pretty sure about this, that I discuss paradoxes before nine. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a good idea, but okay, I'll do my best. So, um, we have uh, more or less uh, half an hour. Uh, there's, uh, okay, 40, uh, 41 minutes, uh, to be more precise. Uh, I would like to, uh, to save some time at the end for uh, possible questions, because I think the topic is, um, uh, is uh, interesting, quite abstract in a sense, but also, uh, I think, very present in the life of organizations. And uh, if I can do it uh, with discipline, we can have some time to, um, uh, to discuss your questions at the end. So my, my agenda for today uh, is uh, centered on uh, four points. Uh, to start, I think we should uh, discuss what's the meaning of paradox. It's kind of, uh, we all know what's a paradox, but how can we define it? What does it really mean? And um, uh, next, uh, we'll distinguish paradox from other uh, organizational contradictions. Uh, sometimes we uh, take paradox, dilemma, contradiction, uh, tension as uh, synonyms, but I think it's important to, uh, to try to uh, uh, to find the differences between them and to clarify the, the conceptual boundaries. Uh, I'll try not to be too conceptual, but I think at this stage it's important to uh, make some definitions. Uh, then we'll discuss why paradoxes are relevant for organizations. I think we all, we all understand that uh, it's something that we, we feel, but I'll try to clarify uh, the reason why paradoxes are important how, uh, and how do they manifest when we think about uh, the paradoxes confronting manage managers and leaders, how do they uh, manifest, so what shape do they take? And finally, I will discuss some ways to, um, to handle paradoxes. Some ways are very uh, productive, other ways are less productive, and the idea is that uh, it's important to, um, to identify the ways we, we can deal with paradoxes so that we can take advantage of their presence in organizations. As you can see in the slide, this is a monument here in Lisbon. It's a monument to the discoveries. And I think that is, um, that is an element of paradox in, uh, in this monument in the sense that uh, in this case, as in any other case, the guy at the front is the uh, Infanto Enrique, who was the, uh, the mastermind of the, uh, of the discoveries. And I think that in his case, like in any other leadership case, I think that, for example, a good leader is normally, as uh, the great James March put it, uh, both a poet and a plumber. And I like this idea that if you are in a leadership position, you need to be visionary and aspirational, that's one I mentioned, but on the other hand, you have to get things done. And uh, as you can, uh, as you know, um, sometimes people that are uh, visionaries are not that good in terms of execution and vice versa, which means that uh, to be a good leader, um, people have to do very different things. To do one thing uh, competently is not necessarily difficult, but to be competent in doing one thing and its opposite can be quite challenging. And I think that if we take a look at leadership practices, probably we know that good leaders are able to, uh, to master or to handle um, opposing uh, demands. On the other hand, and to give you a second illustration of the presence of paradox in organizations, uh, there are a number of people discussing the evolution of organizations and the idea is that organizations, or at least some organizations, are becoming less hierarchical. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, the traditional hi hierarchies of the past are giving way to new organizations with uh, higher levels of participation, autonomy, etc. And I think that uh, we have a number of very inspirational examples around us, but even in the case of a radically post-hierarchical organization such as Linux, people uh, vote for what they call a benevolent dictator. And again, I think this is quite paradoxical because on the other hand, on the one hand, the organization wants to be quite democratic and decentralized, but on the other hand, the idea is that in order to be uh, able to function as a radically decentralized organization, we need a kind of, an, of a benevolent dictator. Then, when it comes to organizations such as universities, I think that we, uh, we all feel the presence of a number of paradoxes. For example, uh, in the case of faculty, and I'm myself a faculty member, we are supposed to do research, which means that we have to be abstract, we have to zoom out uh, from reality, and we have to see things conceptually. But on the other hand, there is a growing presence and a, a growing feel for the importance of impact. And impact is about zooming in. So the idea is that you have to zoom out and you have to zoom in, which can be quite complicated. And finally, as my last illustration, um, one of the uh, most admired uh, entrepreneurs uh, of these days is Elon Musk. And um, I think that the idea of Elon Musk as someone uh, 
uh, who loves humanity and he is so fond of humanity that he wants to save humanity, namely by creating conditions for people to live in Mars, is complemented by a distaste for, for individuals, for people. So apparently he loves the abstract idea of humanity, but he doesn't like people, which is kind of paradoxical. So what, what I'm trying to say with these examples is that uh, in organizations we are constantly faced with, uh, with paradoxes. So in this sense, paradox is everywhere. Um, and um, what I found interesting about uh, studying paradox is the fact that I don't see paradox as an anomaly. I don't see, I don't see paradox as a, as a signal of managerial incompetence. On the contrary, as I will discuss in my presentation, I think that paradox is constitutive of organizations. So the challenge is how can we take advantage of the presence of paradox in organizations? And um, I think that, as you can see in the symbol, uh, the idea of paradox is quite old. So there's nothing truly new here. Uh, we all know the symbol of the yin yang. And uh, the yin yang, I think it's uh, uh, probably the best uh, visual uh, illustration of, um, of paradox. In the case of yin yang, we have all the, uh, the elements of paradox. And of course, uh, Lao Tzu was not the only one, um, the only one uh, presenting or discussing paradox. For example, the same idea was found in, um, in, old, in ancient Greek uh, philosophy, uh, for example, in the case of Heraclitus, the famous idea that you cannot, uh, you cannot swim twice in the waters of the same river because the river is the same, but it's changing all the time, which means that there's a, uh, there's a balance, there, uh, there is um, a distension between uh, stability and change. And if we look at the world of organizations, there are a number of expressions that are also indicative of the presence of paradox. For example, I have picked just a, a few examples. Uh, this notion of uh, creative destruction, uh, as presented by Schumpeter, it's, uh, it's about uh, a paradoxical tension between doing something new and destroying the, uh, the old, but uh, the tension is there. Uh, the idea of cohopetition, um, it's uh, again um, uh, an element of, uh, of paradox, there's a, a synthesis here. Uh, the notion of loose coupling, so the two uh, terms are opposite. Dynamic efficiency, glocal, etc. You name it. So um, I think that uh, these terms uh, indicate the presence of um, of paradox in organizations, and they are just another uh, illustration of um, of uh, the presence of this idea in the world of organizations. So uh, when it comes to managerial practice, I think that um, if we look at the things we do every day, uh, we see uh, paradoxes all around us. For example, um, organizations are typically confronted with the need to. Uh, think about the global and the local. This is kind of one of the. Uh, this is probably one of the well-known uh, paradoxes of these days. Inside organizations, we have uh, paradoxes around the idea of control and freedom. How can we free people? How can we give them autonomy while at the same time maintaining a necessary level of control? Uh, how can we uh, benefit from differentiation and specialization, but at the same time make sure that we integrate knowledge so that the organization works well together? Uh, on the other end, there is the, uh, this tension around uh, routine and um, innovation. I mentioned already the tension between stability and change. So the idea is that organizations need to have some stability so that they can change. And finally, there is this, uh, this well-known paradox between exploration and exploitation. So we need to do new things, but at the same time, we need to take advantage of the uh, old things. So uh, with these six examples, my uh, intention is just to illustrate the, um, the presence of a number of paradoxes in organizations. And in this sense, I think it is possible to defend that uh, what distinguishes a good, a good leader or a good organization is the fact that uh, it can handle uh, these tensions in a productive way. So, uh, this said, how can uh, we uh, define a paradox or what is a paradox? Now, I'll be quoting um, Smith and Lewis. They are uh, two of the, uh, the most important names in the study of organizational paradox. And they uh, discuss paradox in a very simple way. I like the, um, the efficiency of the definition. They said that the paradox uh, is, um, uh, is constituted or composed by interrelated opposites that persist. Which means that in a paradox we have three uh, building blocks. On the one hand there is opposition to things that oppose one another, like for example instability and change. Uh, on the other hand, these opposites are interdependent, meaning that you cannot understand one without understanding the other. And if you want to go back to the symbol of the yin yang, I think the uh, uh, the opposite part in each uh, in each element of the uh, of the symbol represents this interdependence. And um, and finally, there is an element of persistence, and this is very important for the understanding of the meaning of paradox because uh, if uh, one uh, contradiction is a true paradox it will persist, which means that we cannot solve it once and for all. Uh, in other words, we have to live with it. 
uh, let me uh, explain. For example, uh, an organization may uh, focus on change, but at some point it will need some stability to take advantage of the things it is discovering. An organization can emphasize the need, of, the need to discover new things, to innovate, but at some point it will be critical to do something with these innovations, which means that in a true paradox, we can ignore for, a, for some time one of the sides in the opposition, but after a moment, the other side will come to haunt us, and that's the definition of a true paradox. And I think that you can imagine the implication. If paradoxes persist, then we have to live with them, which means that we cannot solve them, we cannot get rid of them, and in this sense, the question is, what can we, uh, we do with, um, with, uh, with paradox? And with this understanding, I think that now we have the conditions to, um, to separate or to distinguish paradoxes from other types of contradictions. Uh, let me just um, say that I think that um, uh, tennis table or ping pong is probably a good description of, uh, or a good illustration of paradox in the sense that you have the tension, you keep, you try to get rid of the ball, but the ball keeps coming back, so there's nothing you can do unless uh, play and try to get the, uh, the best result of, out of this tension between uh, one side and the other. So, uh, this said, um, what is the, um, uh, the distinction between paradox and other uh, terms that are in the conceptual neighborhood of, um, of uh, paradox? So, people have um, made a number of um, distinctions between uh, elements in the, um, in, the, in the conceptual vocabulary of paradox, and for example, uh, it's important to distinguish paradox and contradiction. In the case of contradiction, the idea is that we have two things that are uh, in opposition. And in this sense, uh, the world is seen uh, as bipolar, meaning that we have one thing and the other. And I think that this distinction is important for one very simple reason. Sometimes when we think about the world, we see the world as made of contradictions, and we see the world uh, in a dualistic way. What's a dualism? And that's uh, the challenge at uh, eight, at nine. Now it's nine, so it's uh, more appropriate. Uh, what's the difference between a dualism and a duality? I think that sometimes, namely in the West, we tend to, th to see the world according to this perspective. We have one thing or the other, but one thing as uh, explained by uh, Greek philosophers, one thing cannot be the opposite of itself, which means that we have a contradiction and we have to select one pole or the other. And this is, for example, visible in the case of a dilemma. In the case of a dilemma, we, uh, we, have, the, we have a contradiction, two alternatives, and we have to pick one. Uh, probably the, the best known dilemma in the world of uh, management and organizations is uh, the make or buy dilemma. Sometimes we have uh, to make this decision, either we make one thing or we buy it. And uh, for example, in our companies, in our universities, this is, this is very obvious. We do some things, we buy others. The thing is, if a contradiction or if the tension is a true dilemma, then we can make a choice, we pick one alternative, and it's done. And the good news is that the other side will not come to haunt us because a dilemma uh, can be solved this way. The decision can be good or bad, but um, once it is made, it's done. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages in alternatives, but to some extent, that is actually a, a dualism in the sense that the opposites are separated. Um, then, uh, another, um, another term that is different from uh, paradox is a dialectic, and I'll come to explain uh, how to use these tensions in, in organizations, but in the case of a dialectic, that is, um, uh, if you remember your Hegel from, from high school, uh, Hegel said that in, in the world we have an opposition between uh, thesis and antithesis, and what's interesting about a dialectical view of the world is that sometimes the, the tension between the thesis and antithesis produces something new, call it a synthesis. And what's interesting is that this is different from a paradox in the sense that in a paradox you don't have necessarily a, a synthesis. And what's interesting, as we will describe in a few minutes, what's interesting, as I was saying, is that sometimes uh, some organizations are able to do some, you know, some very good work and some magical things because they understand the power of uh, dialectics, which means that uh, dialectics is uh, one uh, contradiction, but not exactly a uh, paradox. And uh, finally, we sometimes use the word uh, tension. Uh, tension is important in, uh, in the management of paradox, uh, and it refers to the emotional side of a paradox. And I think we all know that um, when dealing with paradoxes, when having to make difficult choices, uh, we feel sometimes the, uh, 
uh, the results of this tension. Uh, paradoxes can be very frustrating, they can be very emotionally taxing, uh, they can pose difficult uh, alternatives, and it's very, very difficult to handle paradox, which means that uh, when dealing with paradox, people are often confronted with state of emotional tension, and this is one of the, um, uh, one of the, uh, the implications of accepting and living with, um, uh, with, uh, with paradox. So, what's the implication? The implication, I think, and we are now going to, uh, to move to, the, uh, to uh, the next point in my presentation, the implication is that there is now some, some people trying to present paradoxes as management tools, but the fact is that as a management tool, paradox will always be uncomfortable because of this dimension of tension. So it's always difficult to handle a paradox, and uh, namely it's difficult because uh, paradoxes can um, participate in the construction of uh, circles, organizational circles. And what's a circle? Again, I think that we all know the, uh, the meaning of uh, circles in our organization. Sometimes we feel that our organization is in a vicious circle. Sometimes we feel it's in a virtuous circle. Sometimes organizations, they grow and apparently everything we do is positive and good. Sometimes it's the opposite. We try to change the organization and the more we try, we try to change it, the, the more it resists, which means that the less it is open to change. And some people say that one of the reasons why organizations go round in circles is because of the way they handle paradoxes. In other, in other words, it's, uh, it's very likely that at some point paradoxes kind of uh, take a life of their own and um, uh, their management becomes so difficult that it escapes the intention of, um, of, um, of managers. Let me just uh, give you an example of uh, this difficulty. Um, when organizations try, for example, to uh, gain uh, control, uh, namely during a crisis such as the one we have experienced here, uh, you increase control. But if you remember from my previous explanation, the other side of control in the yin yang symbol is freedom. And the more you crave for control, the more uh, freedom becomes important, which means that uh, at some point the system uh, is unbalanced and the more you try to solve a problem, the more it spirals and becomes more of the same, which means that at some point it puzzles leaders, it puzzles decision makers, and it gets very, very difficult to uh, solve. And uh, in this sense, what I'm saying is that paradoxes are necessarily difficult to uh, manage and to handle, uh, but still, uh, I think they do uh, matter for organizations, and they do matter for uh, different reasons. So why do they matter? I think that uh, on the basis of the, um, of the literature, we can say that paradoxes are critical because uh, first of all, they are constitutive. As I said before, uh, I don't take paradoxes as manifestations of bad management. I don't think that they are um, uh, anomalies, so they are part and parcel of the life of organizations. For example, organizations are composed by people with different interests, different goals, different motivations, and this inevitably creates contradictions. For example, every time we try to change something in the organization, uh, the past and the future will probably collide. So, this is inevitable, and uh, in this sense, organiz organizing necessarily uh, invites uh, the emergence of paradox. But interestingly, I think that one of the characteristics of good organizations is that they are good and competent in the management of paradox. Let me illustrate with one example. Some people claim that the superiority of the Toyota production uh, system comes to the fact that the company has been able to combine two opposite philosophies. On the one hand, Toyota is very Tayloristic, meaning that work is very fragmented, uh, the company is heavily controlled, routine goes very deep, and in this sense we have all the uh, characteristics associated with Taylorism. But on the other hand, the company is very, very anti-Tayloristic, meaning that it's, uh, it, uh, it's very participative in some dimensions, it invites people to think, and uh, in this sense we have a combination of Taylorism and uh, anti-Taylorism that explains the uh, superiority of their uh, management system, which means that the company is productive and um, it's a, a good exemplar of uh, management, not, because, um, not only because of, the, of its capacity to accept or depart from Taylorism, but because of the way it handles this, um, these two philosophies. And in this sense, to understand the functioning of organizations, I think we need to understand or to take into account uh, the way organizations are able to, um, to articulate opposing demands. So, uh, now, uh, after explaining why I think that paradoxes are relevant, what's a paradox, why paradoxes are different from dilemmas and other contradictions, let's try to see uh, 
how they, um, how they emerge in organizations. And um, over the last years, a number of authors have tried to understand uh, how do paradoxes express themselves, how do they become visible, how do they manifest, and there's um, a consensus that um, there are uh, four uh, main types of paradoxes, or in other ways, in other words, paradoxes become salient uh, as um, paradoxes of learning, paradoxes of performing, belonging, and organizing. And I'll try to uh, explain uh, each of these uh, types and uh, their implications for uh, management. So, when it comes to um, learning, uh, what kinds of uh, paradoxes do we have? I think that <clears throat> it's now um, accepted that organizations need to uh, renew themselves. Um, organizations cannot uh, stand still in a world that is constantly evolving. And um, in this sense, a first way to handle the, um, uh, a first way to, uh, to handle paradox or a first manifestation of paradox uh, comes from the, um, uh, the case of, uh, of learning. So the question is, how do organizations learn? Or in other words, how does my organization learn? And one of the most important tensions around uh, learning comes from uh, the, uh, the paradox or the tension around exploration and exploitation. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure about your familiarity with the terms. Are they familiar? Is it better to explain them? Should I explain them? Yeah, okay, good. So, um, sometimes um, organizations uh, learn and change without actually learning and changing. Probably some of you have uh, watched this movie, The, uh, the Leopard by Visconti. Uh, it's, um, it's a fascinating story in which at some point the main character says that sometimes we need to change something so that we uh, keep all the same. In other words, sometimes we change in order not to change. Uh, what does it mean? I think that this is a good illustration of exploitation. Exploitation refers to the process in which an organization improves the, the things that, is, that it is already doing. In other words, there are things we know how to do, we perfect them, and the organization, in this sense, is learning. But what's the problem with this type of learning? The problem with this type of learning is that we are learning to improve uh, the things we already do. And you can, see the, uh, you can see the consequence. What's the consequence? If we are improving the way we do things, probably other companies are doing things in different ways. And um, if we know how to exploit, but not how to explore, then we have a problem. What's the problem? We are perfecting a solution that one day will probably become obsolete because other companies are doing things in different ways. And uh, doing things in different ways, discovering novelty is the meaning of exploration. So uh, in the case of higher education, for example, the question is how can we take advantage of the new digital technologies to revamp our uh, teaching models? How can we use the new technologies to find new markets, etc.? This is uh, exploration. Exploitation is about uh, improving the, uh, the model we currently have. The question is, uh, which pole is more important, exploration and expo or exploitation? And as always happens in the case of paradox, the answer is both. We need them both. It's important to have exploration. It's important to uh, improve exploitation. Why do we need exploitation? We need to take advantage of the things we have. Why do we need exploration? We need to prepare for the future. What's the problem? Typically, organizations that excel in doing new things are not that good in terms of improving routines and vice versa, which means that it is important to have them both, but uh, most companies are good in one uh, dimension, not necessarily uh, the other. Um, fortunately, there are uh, examples of companies that have been able to, um, to combine these two uh, modes, and these companies uh, are called ambidextrous. So the idea is that we can be competent both in discovering newness and also in terms of, um, uh, of uh, taking advantage of the things we have. So this is the paradox of learning. How can uh, we learn for today and for tomorrow? Then a second manifestation of paradox, a very important one, refers to goals. And the question here is how, we, how do we define uh, our goals and how do we balance goals in such a way that we create more sustainable organizations? In this case, I think that uh, an obvious example or an important example of, the, of this paradox in practice is the, the tension between uh, the short run and the long run. Uh, how can we get results for today uh, without uh, impairing the organization's future? In other words, how can we prepare uh, the organization of the future without threatening the organization's presence? 
uh, in this case, I think that um, the, the challenge uh, is, very, uh, is very difficult to handle, but very simple to explain. How do we make sure that we have the necessary level of uh, management? And I'm assuming that management has more to do with execution and doing things for today, while simultaneously having competent leadership, which means preparing the organization for the future, infusing the system with change, um, making the, organizational, the organization passionate about something that is only in the long run. Uh, but there are many other examples of uh, possible uh, paradoxes around performance. For example, uh, there are tensions between uh, creating value for shareholders and creating value for other stakeholders. And we all know that sometimes the focus on uh, value creation for shareholders exists in opposition with the creation of value for a number of other constituents, which, me which means that every time an organization designs a goal, probably it will uh, open uh, some paradox. Then. A third dimension of paradox refers to uh, belonging. And paradoxes of belonging refer to identity. And the question here is, who are we as an organization and how can we handle a common identity? To what extent do we need a culture that is widely shared and that is intense or strong enough to, uh, to create this sense of cohesion? But on the other hand, how do we want people to uh, express their uh, divergences in a productive way? Which means that in good organizations, there is a balance or a tension between uh, the capacity to accept that we share some, some, some common values, some common ideas, a common identity, if you want. But at the same time, there is also space for uh, expressions of different values, different identities, uh, different ways of thinking. Uh, of course, uh, in good organizations, this paradox is handled in a, in a good way. Uh, I mean, uh, there will be uh, something in common, but also some uh, space for uh, variability. Uh, in other organizations, the tension uh, will be uh, pushed to one extreme. In some cases, we, uh, we can force people to share the same identity, and uh, this, at the extreme, will lead to some form of totalitarianism. Uh, in other cases, uh, we have systems that are fragmented and that collapse because of the lack of something in common. Uh, in the case of organizations, uh, this is probably critical to uh, be able to handle the, uh, the previous paradoxes, namely, how can we accept the organization's identity, but at the same time ch challenge this identity in terms of the way uh, we uh, define uh, new products and um, implement our uh, mission. And finally, there are paradoxes of um, organization. So, uh, the idea, as I mentioned before, is that when we try to organize a system, the system will confront us with a number of contradictions. And uh, some of the most important ones have to deal with, for example, with uh, the tension between control and freedom. Uh, do we want our organization to be uh, a highly controlled system? And of course, control has a number of advantages. Uh, it creates more predictability. Uh, it creates uh, more... Um, more efficiency, but on the other hand, uh, if control uh, is excessive, then the organization will be probably deprived of psychological energy, of the enthusiasm coming from uh, freedom, etc. So uh, the question is, how can we balance control and freedom in, um, in a good way? And I think that this is the challenge for every organization that is now trying to take advantage of uh, uh, its uh, knowledge workers. How do we give people space uh, without, um, without destroying it's, um, it's, um, it's creativity. So, knowing that there are at least these four uh, types of paradoxes, the next question is, how can we handle them? And this is probably the most uh, prescriptive part of my uh, presentation. And uh, there are uh, five main ways of handling a paradox. And um, I'll explain them briefly uh, so that we, uh, we get some, some practical takeaways from the, the presentation. So, how can we handle paradoxes? Well, first, we can go to the neither nor uh, approach, then it can be either or, both and, both or, either and. And I will explain them in a minute. It can, you know, these, these distinctions can look like a play of words, but I think that uh, there's much more than this, and the idea is that in practice, we all confront paradoxes probably with one of these five uh, approaches. So. First one, I've been saying that uh, in the world of organizations, uh, we are uh, confronted most of the time with, um, uh, with paradoxes, but I suspect that um, people normally in organizations don't think about their organizations as paradoxical. Uh, on the contrary, I think that very often paradox is seen as a demonstration of something absurd. And organizations are not supposed to be absurd. 
they are supposed to be rational and um, in a sense the presence of the absurd is a challenge or a threat to the quality of management. And if this is the mindset, I think that um, uh, there will be a, a, a probability that the organization will approach the paradox uh, from this perspective, neither nor. And uh, this perspective means that when we have two poles in tension, for example, exploration or exploitation, you don't think about them as being in, in, in relation. They are different processes, and we don't even articulate them as elements of a duality. So if you want, and going back to my previous uh, point, you see them as, uh, as um, from a dualistic perspective. They are two different things, no relation between them, so we don't have to care, which means that the paradox will probably go uh, undetected. And in this sense, reality will not be uh, framed as, um, as paradoxical. So what are uh, the advantages? The first advantage is that um, you don't have, we don't have to live with the tension created by paradox because actually there is no paradox at all. And um, what's, the, uh, what's the cost? The cost is that, of course, the advantage of uh, articulating opposites will be lost. Um, let me just uh, clarify that according to uh, people who study paradox, we, we have to see paradox from a, a dual perspective. On, on, the one, on the one hand, paradoxes are real in the sense that they are out there, meaning that uh, when we create organizations, there will be necessarily this uh, tension, and the tension exists, uh, no matter what we think about it. But on the other hand, uh, paradoxes are also socially constructed, which means that we can frame reality as paradoxical or not. And uh, this approach happens when we don't frame reality as paradoxical, which means that there can be a paradox out there, but I don't see it. So for me, reality is black or white, not like a yin-yang in which black and white uh, complement one another. I suspect that when it comes to organizations, including universities, this is probably the... Um, uh, this is probably the, uh, the most common uh, answer, and the problem of this answer is that uh, we don't even think about uh, the implications of our decisions. And yet, if we think about organizations, and uh, if we think about universities, and if I think about my own school, for example, at this moment we are kind of torn apart between this dilemma. Should we have more impact, or should we invest in research? And we are having this discussion at this uh, very moment, and uh, as, you, as you know, this is a very difficult discussion because uh, some people think that organizations should focus on research. Some people think that organizations should do things with impact. And the question is, how can we, uh, how can we combine them in a productive way? Uh, which means that we need to find uh, alternatives. And the second alternative is uh, this one, either or. Uh, in this case, we are aware that there is a tension, say, between research and impact. And we need to do something with it. So a very easy solution, and I think a poor solution, consists in selecting one of the poles. We assume that one pole is the one that matters now, and that's it. We choose. What is the problem? If we frame a paradox in this way, we are treating it as a dilemma. And paradoxes are no dilemmas, which means that if we make a decision that, for example, we want more research, one day we will have impact revisiting us, which means that uh, this choice has a number of advantages, but also a number of disadvantages. The, the advantage is that I think that selecting one pole or the other is quite simple. And of course, it will depend on the power of leaders, the power of the, um, of the, the dominant coalition, and we can easily defend any arguments. Uh, the, um, the implication or the negative implication is that sometimes it's, it's very likely that your organization, while treating a paradox as a, as a dilemma, uh, will invest more in one of the poles. In other words, it will become better at the dimensions in which it's already doing well, which means that the organization is probably uh, going in the direction of uh, the Icarus paradox, meaning that we will improve our existing solutions and we will forget about uh, new alternatives. So uh, this is a simple solution, but one with um, a number of negative implications. Now, as a third possibility, some people are saying that this is not what we want. We, we don't want um, any of the, the previous solutions. And we need to move beyond uh, this idea of a paradox as a dualism, and we need to find uh, synergies between the two poles. And uh, the both-end approach is now being defended, for example, by Wendy Smith and her colleagues. And uh, they say that uh, what's interesting about paradox and about the, the tensions between poles is that if we find the synergies, we can turn opposites into complementarities. And while doing that, we can do well today, 
while preparing for the future. Let me uh, give you one example presented by, uh, by Wendy Smith herself. She said that at some point, IBM was doing very well in, with, uh, in personal computers, which was the, the current business, but they were already seeing the cloud um, emerging as a, as a very powerful technology. So the question is, what should we do? Uh, should we invest more in PCs, or should we uh, move our uh, core uh, to the cloud? And the both-end solution, or an ambidextrous approach, means that we need to, uh, we need to focus on our current business, because the, uh, the present depends on this, but at the same time, we need to immediately start to invest uh, significantly in the preparation of the future. So, uh, in other words, uh, we need both uh, solutions. So it's, uh, it's both poles, and we need to move forward uh, with, uh, with the two uh, in mind. So this is the, uh, uh, the type of approach coming from uh, both end perspectives. So the idea of transforming paradoxes into uh, synergies, which means that um, instead of um, having the organization selecting one pole, we need to somehow integrate uh, the two. But there's another possibility. There's the both-or possibility, which basically corresponds to dialectics. As you probably remember, I mentioned a few minutes ago that dialectics has to do with, um, with transforming a thesis and an, and an antithesis into something new. And um, I think that when organizations know how to do it well, they can do something different, and uh, sometimes very they can be very successful on the basis of dialectics. Uh, I picked this image of the, uh, the movie Up, by Pixar, probably you know the movie, right? Yeah? Because some people claim that what's interesting about Pixar is the fact that they master the heart of synthesis very, very well. When you go to, uh, the, to the theater to, to uh, watch a Pixar movie, uh, probably you will be, uh, if you go with a, with, a, with a child, probably the adult and the child will be uh, watching two movies simultaneously. And up for an adult, I think, is a very sad movie, isn't it? It's very sad. It's, a, it's about loss. It's about, um, it, it's about personal tragedies. But for a child, what is up? It's a very funny movie. With a, we know a house that flies with lots of balloons, magical creatures, etc. Sometimes people say, some observers, that the magic of Pixar is that it was able to realize the, uh, that you can have a very sad movie together with a very happy movie, and you put them together inside the same movie. And that's a very practical uh, use of this notion of, um, of dialectics, which means that sometimes these things can look very philosophical, very abstract, but the fact is that if companies know how to use them, then they can really make a difference. And finally, uh, and I think that this is probably the, um, the, the example that illustrates the most productive approach to paradox, I think that paradox is very difficult to handle because of the tension that I mentioned earlier. Paradoxes are difficult to handle, that they, are, they are emotionally taxing, it's difficult to, to live with them, but on the other hand, they can be very stimulating and they can impede an organization from uh, resting on its laurels. And uh, one of my colleagues, Susanna, she, uh, she gave me this illustration. I was not aware of this Valentino shoes. Uh, well, um, <laughs> my apologies. But she said that, you know, what's interesting about uh, Valentino is that um, they are productive in a number of senses, but you have to accept the discomfort. And that's probably the, uh, the challenge to manage paradoxes. Um, on the one hand, paradoxes can be very productive, but on the other hand, they will necessarily produce, uh, produce a level of discomfort. Why? Because, as I mentioned earlier, they will, have, uh, they will confront us with a number of dilemmas, ambiguities, difficulties, and there's one thing. We never know if the choice we are making is the right choice. And that's probably the, the most difficult thing about uh, paradox. Um, my final slide, uh, just to wrap things up. Uh, what's, the, uh, what, what's the message? What are the takeaways? Well, first of all, there's now a buzz in academia around this idea of paradox. But paradox is a very old idea. It's not, nothing new. We are just appropriating the idea. But the idea was there for millennia. On the other hand, if we look at reality with a paradoxical lens, then uh, there are a number of things we can do. Uh, namely, we will depart from dualism to duality. And I think that philosophically and managerially, du duality or the capacity to put things together is probably much more promising than uh, dualism. Uh, this is valid, I think, not only for organizations or for business firms, but also for politics. I think that in politics, probably we need a shock of duality. So instead of separating, we need to see how different things can actually make the world much more interesting. Uh, my third point is that 
uh, tension and contradiction can be uncomfortable, but uh, probably, uh, as sometimes uh, is said, no pain, no gain. So uh, organizations need to feel the pain of paradox to take advantage of uh, oppositions. And um, finally, I think that it's possible that uh, one of the reasons uh, why it's difficult to find persistently sustaining organizations, organizations that live for, for long periods of time, is because uh, we don't know how to deal uh, with paradox in the long run. Because normally, uh, we are entrapped by uh, dualism, and at some point, we choose an either-or solution rather than a genuinely paradoxical approach. I have 42 seconds, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>